Hello, welcome to Unlocking Landscapes, the first Unlocking Landscapes episode recorded speaking to another person outside rather than at a computer on Zoom. So this is a great moment, so thanks for joining. So today I'm talking to Dr Beth Nichols, who works on pollinators, I like to call her a bee doctor, and she works for the University of Sussex. And we're going to be having a little walk around Beadlands near Burgess Hill in West Sussex. And Beth is going to be talking about the things that she studies to do with bees, what got her interested in bees and pollinators, and the sort of work that she does, and her hopes and fears for the future. So thanks for listening. Let's meet Beth. Is that a train? Oh, maybe. <laughs> I'm here at Beadlands Nature Reserve with Beth Nichols, Dr. Beth Nichols, and we're here to talk about pollinators. Um, so, welcome, Beth. Hi, How are you? Well. Yeah, I'm good, thank you. Thanks for inviting me to record the podcast. And uh, who have you got with you today? We've got Phyllis the Poodle. Phyllis the Poodle. is really great at field work. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely not a distraction, a nuisance at all. <laughs> yeah, do you want to say hello, Phyllis? <laughs> Phyllis. <laughs> that was absolutely perfect. So I've never been here before. This is we're near, sort of in Burgess Hill in West Sussex, uh, in the Sussex Weald. Um, and the moment we're, look, we're standing underneath an oak tree at the the edge of a field we're surrounded by bracken uh the the meadows are looking quite sort of brown and and over really um there's lots of thistles and stuff mm. i think you can hear some are those aspens or poplars poplars <laughs> those are poplars yeah oh, trembling cool. you can also hear there's a train line with some sort of slow maybe like cargo um traffic going over it but this isn't a train spotting podcast so <laughs> And the moment it is, we're in trouble. So Beth, what can you tell us about Beadlands Nature Reserve? Yeah, so I actually came here for the first time last year, a bit earlier in the year. Um, I believe it used to be um, a farm and then it's kind of been reverted to wildflower meadows. Um, and at one point it was managed by the University of Sussex, I think, but I'm not sure that it is anymore. But um, certainly earlier in the year, it was excellent for um, marsh orchids um, and other types of orchid. Um, and I think it's just a really nice site in that it's very um, diverse for flor flowers and pollinators but also you see a lot of people here kind of using the area recreationally as well so it's a really accessible nature reserve because it's quite close to the um, the centre of Burgess Hill really so yeah it's a little gem I think and this is a sort of classic weald and meadow isn't it um, can you tell us do you know much about weald and meadows I mean what what sort of plants you get in them or I'm anything like that <laughs> you're terrible at plants <laughs> for someone that works on bees i'm terrible at plants <laughs> yeah but you hear that though because there's there's a there's a photographer i really like called thomas shahan who does loads of macro stuff and of insects yeah, yeah yeah amazing photos but I, I was watching one of his videos recently and he said he wants to learn plants and i was like i just just amazed me that he doesn't know yeah i think um so i'm a bee biologist and i've always focused on the behavior of the bees and the perspective of bees and there are a few people at Sussex who work on plant biology and we've started a kind of um, group where we meet and discuss research and it's been so helpful because they help me to see things more from the plant perspective and vice versa but there is a tendency in science because you become so specialised on one area to kind of uh, just focus on your study organism and maybe you don't then have the time to kind of um, consider all the other um, aspects of their ecology for example but obviously plant and pollinator interactions are really important so I do need to get better at identifying plants for sure. Yeah so what is it that you do then what is your your work? Um, so at the moment I'm looking at pollen foraging in bees um, so people have looked a lot at what bees learn when they visit flowers to collect nectar um, but nobody's really considered pollen um, because it's quite a complicated system it um, contains lots of different nutrients um, and bees typically don't eat it when they're collecting it from flowers so it's a little bit tricky to know how are they 
assessing what's good pollen or what's not so good pollen um, for their young to be reared on. So my work looks at um, the sensory organs of bees and how um, they might be able to perceive differences in pollen quality and then also how they use that information to decide oh I'm going to land on this flower rather than this other flower so that's really what my research looks at and ultimately that should help us to understand kind of how bees move within a landscape or within a wildflower patch um, and could help farmers for example to um, keep pollinators um, visiting crop flowers for example rather than um, leaving the crop and foraging elsewhere so there are some um, hopefully some kind of direct applications of the work later down the line as well Great stuff. Um, I'm just wondering how someone gets to be like a, I think I've called you a bee doctor. A bee doctor. How, how does someone get to be a bee doctor? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. So I, um, I did an undergraduate degree at the University of Wales in Bangor um, and I really love that. We did loads of field work and it's, it's a really kind of amazing place to, to live and study. Um, and during that degree, I became really interested in animal behavior specifically. So I went to Exeter to do a master's in that. And I was always really interested in insects because they have some of the kind of weirdest behaviours. They can, you know, change sex during their lifetime or... Um, <laughs> I don't know if you know about fig, fig wasp pollination where... Um, no, I don't, know. Kind of the males, the, the brothers of the female fi fig wasps, wasps get sort of trapped inside the fig and they end up mating with their sisters and then the sisters burrow out and disperse but the males end up kind of trapped in there so there's all kinds of weird weirdness going on there so I just always thought insects have some of the most interesting behaviours and also because their kind of brains are so small but they can do quite complicated behaviours it's really interesting to ask um, you know how can they have these complicated uh, societies in the case of bees for example with relatively small brains how do they you know what are the kind of quite simple mechanisms or rules that they use to um, organize themselves I guess that's one of the questions that I found really fascinating about bees so yeah after my master's I kind of reached out to a few different academics at, at Exeter about doing a PhD and then I was lucky enough to get to do a PhD on honeybees um, and then I've just kind of worked various um, research and and non-research jobs since then but mostly around pollinators it's a shame that they can't call it a PHB I know it should be called that shouldn't it and it's funny whenever I'm writing and I have to write the word B I always end up adding <laughs> two E's to it you know like to be oh, yeah. I, yeah, yeah. I always end up adding an extra E by accident um, but yeah a PhD any other puns you want to get out of your system now um, <laughs> let's give it some time okay We're only seven I think minutes I've heard in. them all but you never know right <laughs> only seven minutes in come on um, I do want to ask you about wasps a bit later because sure. I love wasps I think they're awesome and people people hate wasps yeah people really do but they right? don't but know they're, they're fascinating and there's also there's like in the UK which is like nature depleted we've got like thousands of species of yeah. them and everyone just cares about one and bees are just vegetarian wasps so yeah. bees evolve from wasps yeah. um, wasps get their protein from meat or from other insects and bees just happen to get their protein from pollen but really they're all descendant from wasps and bees didn't social bees arrive they evolved like 100 million years ago, is that right? Maybe. Maybe. It's those Dave Goulson <laughs> books, question. it's all in there. Yeah, if he said that, then it's probably true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah if... but actually sociality is kind of rare in bees, as you, you probably already know. Like, we have... Yes, yeah. it is, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, so there's the bumblebees, there's about 24 species, I think, in the UK, and then um, honeybees. Um, but then most most other bees in the UK of the other kind of 250 or so species are solitary they might nest together in aggregation yeah. so that's why you might see lots of burrows in the ground together but actually each one of those burrows typically is a individual nest yeah um or you know when they're using bee hotels each one of those tubes is an individual female they just kind of aggregate because often um there's not that much suitable habitat so once one of them finds a good area then lots of others will colonize it as well yeah and yeah, that's that's really interesting because um, people often think that solitary bees are social, don't they? Because they're mm. in the bee houses and stuff, but they're not. Um, it, it's interesting in in the UK because everyone knows about the honeybee, which isn't actually even a native species, is it? No, um, they um, kind of originated in 
India and Southeast Asia. And they brought over actually... by the Romans, is that right? Oh, yeah, maybe. I'm not sure. They've been here okay. a long time. Yeah, a long and I, time, I guess yeah. they're sort of... I mean, I used to hear this stat about, oh, there are no wild honeybees left in the UK, but I'm not sure whether we would ever really call them wild. What people mean by that is you don't get them kind of nesting in trees, um, you know, that, that they're all kind of managed pollinators. So, the num you know, often... People have used number of beehives to track pollinator declines, for example, but actually that really depends on the economics of keeping bees and how many beehives a beekeeper wants to have. Um, and obviously they face some challenges from disease and pesticides that, that wild pollinators face as well, but they're not, it's not really a very good measure of kind of bee declines to use bee, beehives because they're dependent on lots of other factors as well. Um, and cool. in India, there's actually a couple of different species of honeybee. So there's Apis dorsata, which you might have seen on um, nature documentaries. So they're they're the giant um, Asian honeybee, uh, okay. and they they're pretty badass. So they don't bother to kind of nest in a hole or anything. They just they just hang down from a branch, like when you see a swarm. Um, and they actually migrate through the forest. Um, so tracking floral resources, because in the wow. tropics you get quite patchy distributions right um, but what's really interesting is that they'll often come back to the same spots and nobody really knows how they kind of know you know know where they've nested before or where they've aggregated before so they're really cool and then you get apis florea which are really really tiny honeybees what about the ones that um because i've seen that that documentary um i think it's in an african country when the people follow is it the honey there's a bird. Oh, yeah, is the it the honey, honey call? The, yeah, or is it? Oh. They call it the honey call. I mean, is yeah, it called a honey guide? Maybe honey guide or something. Yeah. Yeah, that's so cool. And is that is that the honey bee that we have, or is it a different species? Uh, you know? There is an Africanized honey bee, so it's, okay. I think it's more closely related to the European okay. one. But um, yeah, that is so cool. So the they've kind of got some communication between the people and the birds, right? So I think they yeah, give yeah, yeah. they give the birds some of the honey right for leading yeah. them to the hives and so um the bird produces a special call to let them know kind of when they've arrived at the hive which is really really cool yeah, yeah. it's really cool <laughs> cool okay let's um let's go for a little walk somewhere else. Yeah, I, there's quite a lot of uh anything. there seems to be some house building or something going yeah, on yeah. in the background <laughs> um yeah, yeah let's have a wonder So we've just stopped um, by some a really nice flower called Bethany. Um, it sounded like I said Bethany there, but I meant to say Bethany, um, which I think is a plant that was used medicinally once upon a time. Um, I mean, I think it's Bethany. It's, it's in the dead nettle family, which is quite mm. a broad family. But I've just noticed, I don't know if you can see this, Beth, there's a wasp spider in there. Ooh. We were just talking about wasps. I know what they look like, but I can't see it. Um, it's right in, right in there. Through. Oh wow! Yeah. yeah, great specimen. She's huge. I saw two the other day down on the coast, but um, nice. I think they're showing up on social media, so there's quite a few of them. Oh, so cool! I'll get a photo of that at some point. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, from oh, from there's one. oh, there's another one. There's another one there, so you could get a really good photo of them. Sorry. Oh, hello. Yeah. <laughs> hello. So they're sort of yeah. You, everyone knows what a wasp looks like, black and yellow, <laughs> but they're a spider. So they're they're a species that are thought to be benefiting from climate change, aren't they? Do you know about oh, that? Oh, really? Wasp spiders? Yeah, or... I think so. Mm, um, I don't necessarily that. think they're native species either, so it's quite interesting to see these mm -hmm. changes taking place. There's, mm -hmm. a, there's a fly there with some very flickery wings, I can see. Um, but just while we're looking at the meadow, Beth, I mean, what is what is the role of, of bees, of the bee community and pollinators in the landscape, in a landscape like this? Yeah, so as we kind of talked about before, there's a huge variety in um, bee species in the UK and across the world as well. So we've got about 250 different species. They're really variable in their size and kind of their um, flower preferences. So generally bees tend to have quite a broad preference for flowers. So it's a little bit of a myth that you have one plant that has one 
pollinator generally plants don't want to exclude pollinators because that kind of maximizes their chances of um, the insect visiting usually the insect collects some kind of reward from the flower like nectar which is what what honeybees for example make honey from or pollen um, and then they'll go and visit another flower of that same species and deposit that pollen and um, pollinate the flower so um, fertilize um, the flower um, and, and be bees and other pollinators are worth a lot of money to the economy aren't they yeah there's the, there's an estimate it's that, a couple of billion isn't it yeah, yeah i can send you the value i can't remember yeah. now i mean it's quite hard to estimate and there's a bit of controversy you know around whether we should value wildlife in that way based on kind of the the services they provide but certainly it's helpful helpful from my perspective when um you know you're you're trying to kind of emphasize why your particular area of research is important if we can kind of highlight the fact that these interactions are not only kind of interesting from a scientific point of view but also have massive implications for crop pollination and it's not just bees that are providing that service as well so wasps like you talked about are also flower visitors um, hoverflies as well um, really important pollinators um, and also butterflies and um, kind of other diptera other flies as well if you look at kind of a lot of flies like blue bottles green bottles they are actually really hairy um, and the hairs on the bee's body or other pollinators body is what's important for kind of picking up those pollen grains and transferring them to other species so hairiness is really important yeah and that, i guess that's one of the things when bees did um switch from being um carnivorous wasps to being uh vegetarian pollen collectors so they wasps also became hairier. wasps aren't hairy they're not as hairy they're right they have some hairs but generally um, bees are a lot hairier also for bumblebees that also helps with kind of um, thermoregulation or, or, or keeping warm because bumblebees are quite unusual among insects in that they actually become more diverse at higher latitudes and further away from the equator um, okay. so they're, they're very cold adapted species and they are a real concern around climate change actually because they're kind of gonna run out of places north to move to or altitudes to move up to um, if if things keep warming up so they they really can't cope with um, super high temperatures so on a, even on a hot day in the UK at mid around midday you wouldn't um, normally see bumblebees foraging it's just too hot for them <laughs> I'm getting wrap, wrapped up here Phyllis is trying to lasso uh, <laughs> Daniel yeah thanks for this um, um, and actually yeah one of my students is looking at that looking at how bumblebees cope with um, with uh, heat waves so she's from Mexico and she's interested in um, these really kind of plus 40 degree um, spells of weather that they're having there and, and what the impact would be on individual bees and also on the colony as well because you do see um quite a lot of die off of bumblebees don't you on like the streets and stuff yeah in, in like july and yeah sometimes they might have just run out of food so there is i mean it's covered a little bit by people having um flowers in their gardens or in parks or, or things like that but traditionally there is a bit of a gap in forage in in june time in the uk um and so um sometimes foragers might just be having to fly a lot further to get enough food and they might just miscalculate and kind of expire but yeah warm temperatures definitely won't help with that as well because they'll they'll be burning through the energy more quickly and there's quite a trend isn't there for um people to get a teaspoon with some sugar water <laughs> do you, i mean do you know does that work or I, it definitely would help to revive bees um yeah uh, it does work yeah, I mean, it depends why the bee has expired on the street. It it could just have naturally kind of come to the end of their life. They work incredibly hard, bumblebees or, or all bees, and they just kind of work until they run out of energy. They don't have a very long lifespan. Um, so I think for a honeybee worker, it's maybe like eight weeks or something total. And certainly once they start foraging, the risks of them getting predated or um, kind of just you know running out of energy or get you know their wings get very worn and damaged over time as well yeah um i suppose on on that note on that subject um 
of bee mortality. Uh, they're also a, food, a key food source, aren't they, for a lot of like bigger animals like birds and stuff. And yeah, badgers love badgers. to eat yeah, um, so what, bumblebees. <laughs> yeah, well, what are the main predators of bees in the UK? Yeah, at a colony level for bumblebees, it would be badgers. So they quite often are sniff them out and dig them out um, and when we do experiments and we put colonies out in the landscape we have to put them in dog crates so that the badgers don't kind of just eat the whole hive and if you've ever looked inside a bumblebee hive it's it's quite disgusting in there they they tend to poo in the nest and they're not very hygienic compared to honeybees so I always find it quite funny that the badgers would just eat that whole thing they eat all the wax as well they just kind of lick the box clean which is quite funny wow um but other than that, I guess uh, birds will take, you know, individual bees on the wing. Um, <laughs> so this is a, a, bit of grooming, a bit of pruning. She's actually just pulled up a, a turkey oak. Billy! Which is um, an invasive species. <laughs> doing, doing some good conservation work there. Yeah. Um, the reason bumblebees are quite disgusting is because the colony only lives for a couple of months um, so the, the colony always dies off at the end of the summer and it's just the new queens that hibernate so they don't have time to worry about keeping things tidy basically so yeah I, I just find it a bit gross that the badgers kind of eat every last bit of that hive but then yeah for, for bees that are foraging kind of on flowers you have um, birds will take bees but also crab spiders have you heard of those yeah, so yeah. they're an amazing kind of sit and wait predator that are really well camouflaged so they're often quite brightly colored so they 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 blend in well with a the flower they'll sit kind of underneath the petals and then when a bee lands just come up and um grab them and bite them uh, and you do often see bees get trapped in spiders webs as well um just trying to think about what else yeah i watched a crab spider recently um get really close to a fly and yeah. seem unable to make up its mind oh really and in the end it just it just it just like let it go flies tend to i mean at least from a human perspective whenever i'm trying to catch insects i always find flies harder to catch them than this bees. fly with got better this, vision, I think. this fly was just the spider was behind it yeah. the fly didn't know it was there and oh, it was just like just nah there. i think i'll wait for something <laughs> better yeah it's really cool watching them hunt isn't it and have you ever seen the because the males are tiny right and um, yeah, yeah. I almost look like a little parasite on them. I've seen that. Before. I I was picking some raspberry. I I only grow raspberries in my garden, a very small little patch, and I was picking some yesterday, and then I realised there was a crab spider hanging from my oh, glasses. Oh really? Oh, from your glasses? Yeah, because I, I I just know because I take lots of photos of them in my garden, and um, you just you know that kind of yeah. That kind, they're looking for a hug, aren't they? But it's, yeah. a, hug, it's a hug you don't want to <laughs> accept because it's a. Uh... Oh, wasps will also eat bees as well, so they um. They often sneak into kind of honeybee hives as well and steal honey yeah. this this time of year as well when they when they're running out of natural resources. So um, bees are pretty good at kind of uh, defending the nest against um, against other insects, but maybe not so great at defending against mammals. And again, the badgers must get stung a lot, but they must just kind of not mind. <laughs> they firm it, as we say in South London. Um, yeah, so I. Because it's quite there's this, I've, I don't know about you, but I notice that in sort of people's perceptions of nature, there's always good and evil. Like people often mm. find an interest in nature from like a hatred of ivy or parakeets mm. Mm. <laughs> or wasps or um, I don't know maybe mink. Some people really hate badgers for some reason, which is yeah. I, I guess I'm I don't think it's acceptable. I don't think it's you know they're a natural food source for badgers. So. But, but there's, yeah, there's, they are definitely kind of yeah do you, do you see that bad. one though with because i i remember seeing a wasp cutting a honeybee to pieces it's with its kind of cool mandibles <laughs> it was yeah i mean you can't relate that to because people relate stuff to human issues don't they and there seems to be this honeybees can do no wrong because mm. they pollinate and they provide us with sweet lovely honey mm. but like the sort of yellow jacket wasps are just hated i mean do you does that ever come up in in your work I mean you do work with the public don't you as well yeah, do you have to have those it conversations it definitely does I mean one of the things yeah I like kind of I guess what I've said here is that you know wasps and bees are, are actually really similar um, but also wasps provide you know a lot of pest control as well um, you know if you're looking for a reason for if you're looking from a oh what do they do for us reason to love them but they're also fascinating in their own right they've also got um, lots of really complex behaviours there's evidence that they might be able to 
recognise um, differences in facial patterns on uh, between each other, so recognise individuals, and they have really complicated kind of social systems as well. But de definitely, um, they're not well loved by people. Um, and and another interesting thing that came out of doing the work with the public is hoverfly larvae as well. I don't know if you're familiar with those, but often they kind of look like a caterpillar or like something that might um, be damaging to your garden. But actually, they're quite the opposite. They're really good at aphid control as well. So a lot of the work that I've done, or a lot of a kind of side effect of the work I've done is kind of just raising awareness of all these, like the different ecology of, of different insects that people might be less familiar with and, and pointing out that, you know, everything has its kind of role in the ecosystem. Um, and you need that kind of balance. But yeah, I, I've had people talking about Asian honey, honeybees, uh, the Asian hornet and really kind of demonizing them and, you know, um, talking about them as if they're this invasive thing that's coming over here and predating on our honeybees. But actually the Asian hornet and honeybees would have kind of co-evolved because they both originate in Asia. So it's actually just that, just that the kind of Asian hornet has almost followed the yeah. species that we've had here yeah. for a long time that, you know, is potentially also doing a bit of damage in terms of competing with native pollinators. So because they live in these big colonies, they can really recruit well to a to a flower resource. And there is some concerns that they might be out competing solitary bees or bumblebees on those resources as well. So Honeybees. Yeah, yeah. it's not a popular opinion because I know lots of people really love keeping bees it's 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 it is a nice hobby it's I, very relaxing but i think um, i think it is becoming more um <laughs> sorry what have you seen there phyllis <laughs> philly come here <laughs> she's on steroids at the moment for an ear infection oh that's made her okay. even avoid rage <laughs> yeah because it seems like that there's more awareness now that like all these hives on rooftops and city centers mm. and stuff where there's you know in cities there's some really high quality like habitat in cities isn't there like in london and with and a lot of kind of pollinator diversity that you don't necessarily get in other places yeah um, but people seem to be more aware of the impact the honeybees are having on kind of urban solitary bee populations and stuff yeah so. i suppose you can because people keep bees honeybees and you can open up the hive and you can directly see oh this this colony that should be doing well hasn't got much food in it um, you know I guess that's raising awareness that oh maybe even though there is often a lot of great resources in cities for pollinators because of people's gardens and the way people plant their gardens to have kind of continuous flowering but I think you know if that honeybee hive that has you know hundreds of thousands of workers is struggling to collect enough food that could potentially mean that solitary bees or bumblebees that have much smaller colonies would be faring even worse um so yeah i do think it is a concern kind of the proliferation and there's a lot of i heard this term the other day bee washing Ooh. that goes on in terms of philly doesn't like bee washing <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of bee washing that goes on from corporations and oh, companies yeah. that yeah stick a bee yeah. on their packaging or stick some hives on their roof and say um we're doing stuff for pollinators um and you know that doing the stuff that benefits all pollinators and wild pollinators is it's harder than just doing that and so it's easier just to get some honey beehives i suppose yeah and so on the, the kind of the darker side of things do you because i mean you're seeing stuff in such detail and at a level that very few people will be seeing in terms of you know how bees and other pollinators are faring i mean are you are you worried about kind of let's say the next 50 years and what it means you know we can only talk about the uk i suppose what it means mm. for like wild bee populations and pollinators in the uk and therefore for us yeah i'm concerned about how they cope with kind of i was gonna say double whammy but it's not even a double whammy like the i'm concerned about how they would how they're going to cope with all these kind of additional stresses so warming temperatures wetter summers potentially that that can be you know it's been a really bad year for bees this year um pesticide use in combination with uh you know monocultures in farmland where you've got these huge fields um that would cover like a like more than double the foraging range of some some um solitary bees so it just means that each in 
<laughs> I was worry. waiting for that. It just means that each individual bee is kind of having to work so much harder to get enough food and at the same time picking up toxic substances, uh, you know, and having to deal with adverse weather that means they can't forage on as many days as perhaps they normally would. So yeah, I'm, I am concerned about the kind of combined effect of all of those stressful influences on their ability to collect enough food and reproduce for sure. And does that include, you know, pesticides? I mean, that is, people are more aware about it now, aren't mm. they? And, and it's, it's such a, it's such a, I don't know, it's such a complex issue, but. There's... It's really complicated, yeah. I mean, because a lot of people say, well, we can't grow food in the way that we currently grow food without pesticides, and I would agree. And I think that's the problem that maybe we shouldn't be growing food <laughs> that way. And, in large monocultures what know, should we less be suitable habitat I, I what mean, should we do differently maybe i'm naive and maybe i'm idealistic but i think going back to kind of more regenerative farming methods and diversifying farms and not you know relying on single varieties of crops and a lot of the crops that are used that lots of pesticides are used on like oilseed rape aren't really used much for food they're used as a biofuel on um <laughs> oilseed rape yeah. the yellow one yeah, yeah the yellow one <laughs> i've got a friend in the czech republic and um he's he's a sort of ornithologist um he, he, that's not his main job mm. but he um they have huge fields of y yellow plants like oilseed rape mm. and uh sunflowers and stuff and he calls them i think it's the five yellow evils because <laughs> he he's seen this decline in birds yep in yep. 30 years that he mm. puts down to a lack of insects yeah, yeah. so um dave Coulson at sussex who you're probably familiar with he has some students who are looking at that and looking at um not just the effects on insects but also because these pesticides a lot of them are applied directly to the seeds and not all of the seeds get kind of drilled into the ground so they've been using um camera traps to look at um kind of what how much seed for example birds are um, eating and what kind of doses of pesticides they might be being exposed to yeah so yeah it is really concerning the kind of trophic effects and also there's been a lot of focus on the effects on bees but not so much work on you know hoverfly larvae or um, butterfly larvae and what we do know is that it's not just the crop that's that contains pesticides there's a lot of leaching out into the wildflower margins into the trees and hedgerows so there's going to be a lot of species affected beyond just those that would visit the crop um, and we are definitely seeing a lot of variability and sensitivity to the pesticides so I do just wonder how some insects might be faring and whether we're kind of overlooking some that are really badly affected by by the chemicals. Okay thanks Beth. Um, before we finish um, <laughs> I usually ask people if they had like unlimited resources, what would they kind of invest invest in? Say the unlocking landscapes war chest is what I like to call it. <laughs> um, <laughs> infinite money, <laughs> um, which is a weird concept. Um, people usually say education, so don't you dare say education, all right? Because it's it's been done now. No, but I if, wouldn't. if you if you had, we know from behaviour change that education alone doesn't work. Okay, so <laughs> if you had you know uh, the, the resources that you needed to do what you wanted to do what what would you do i would kind of look at supporting farmers to make that transition to different um style of farming and that is obviously very risky and costly to make that transition and you might face a lot of losses you know to begin with while you kind of adjust um but i think it would be that would be a really good use of kind of funds to provide some kind of buffer to allow people to kind of um to make those changes to improve their soil quality to uh, improve the di di biodiversity on their farms and um to kind of make space to coexist with nature i guess and and not just kind of have whole areas of the countryside as just big monocultures with not much space for wildlife so basically funding farmers to transition to regenerative farming basically mm. yeah yeah and funding you know uh, i've heard in italy i think it is they do some really interesting um instead of people using pesticides because a lot of pesticides are used kind of prophylactically so just in case and i get that if your business depends on 
you know the profit that you need to make from growing food you can't afford really to take that risk that a pest outbreak might happen um, and decimate your crop so but instead there they have uh, basically insurance so um, I think it's like a co-op so people pay into an insurance fund so that um, you know you can buffer against losses without kind of having to use a lot of chemicals just in case okay thank you um, and just just to finish up it's ending on a sort of more positive mm-hmm. no, not more positive note because you've been very positive um, what what would you recommend that people can do to feel less kind of helpless about the state of bees or other pollinators but maybe something that because people always say oh you can put plants in your garden you can put a bee hotel what's something kind of like out there that you would you could suggest i've totally put you well on the spot there haven't i but your t-shirt does say save the bees it does say save the bees not to bang on about pesticide too much but um there's a lot of pesticides that get used kind of by um councils in kind of maintaining road verges pavements amenity areas parks that kind of thing and um, one thing you could do is if you if you don't agree that that's maybe the best use of resources and a good idea for kind of wildlife and human health alike then you could think about kind of writing to your local council about about that and um there's i think there's a campaign out at the moment actually to um, restrict the use of domestic pesticides so that would be something that you could do that would be positive i think Okay, that's brilliant. Thanks, Beth. Uh, So, yeah, that's it for us out here in this lovely meadow um, with Phyllis. Uh, um, (laughs) Thanks so much for for coming to to meet me and chatting about pollinators. No, thanks. It was fun. Cool. Okay, take care. See you around. Bye. So that was great talking to Beth and meeting her lovely little dog, Phyllis, uh, which you may have heard chewing grass and also extending its lead throughout the conversation. Um... Thanks for tuning in. I hope you enjoy the grasshopper song, also the uh, railway in the background and the planes overhead. But most of all, I hope you enjoyed listening to Beth talk about bees and her amazing knowledge. And it gave you some ideas about things you might want to learn about or maybe do to make a difference. Okay, thanks for tuning in. Bye.